What up, everybody? Happy New Year. Adam here, and we are back. This is the beginning of season two of the Ferment podcast. We had a little hiatus. We had a Selah moment. We took a month off, and now we're back. And I just want to tell you, I am feeling refreshed. I am feeling energized, and I am ready for another year of conversations about worship and spiritual transformation. I'm ready to do this for another 52 weeks. Let's get it. But before we do that, I just want to say one thing. We are kicking off this year with one of my favorite conversations I've had. It's with Chris Lazat, one of my favorite worship leaders and songwriters. And I just want to say there is something tender and gentle about this conversation, and it really affected me. And I hope that comes through for you as well. You want to be sure to listen all the way to the end because Chris prays a really sweet prayer for us at the end that really touched my heart in the moment. It was, um, I don't know, it was something special, and I think you can feel it. Anyhow, just want to say it's good to be back. I'm excited about this conversation. I'm excited about all the conversations we have coming forward, and I'm really, really happy that you're along for the ride. Okay, Casey, why don't you fire up that music, fire up the tunes. Let's get this thing started. Let's do it. Peace. Let's be sacred people in the world, yes. not of the world, but be in the world. We don't need to change from, oh, I lead worship, and I get paid to lead worship at this church on Sundays, but this is what I really do. This is my real love. We'll just do both, you know, but don't change. Like when I see Mavis Staples in front of the president or in front of anybody in the world, and she's always singing about Jesus, and she's so filled up with the joy of the Lord that nobody can deny it. Yeah. People's lives get shaken when they're around her because it's so authentic and real. Why can't we just be the same person in both places? Well, wouldn't that be great if God is just pulling us into that? I think he is. The ferment. Welcome to Season 2 of the Ferment Podcast, Conversations About Worship and Transformation. Today's guest is Chris Lazat. Chris is a worship leader and a songwriter from San Juan Capistrano, California. Best known for his songs, Glory to the King, I Love Your Ways, and I Will Trust You. This episode is brought to you by Monk Drums. Monk Drums is a creative desert venture that strives to combine beauty and business as one heartbeat. Monk Drums' main focus is handcrafted wooden drums that allow us to love, assist, and serve all who accompany us on this path. Use the coupon code FermentPod to get 5% off your Monk Drums order. Find them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Monk Drums. And every Monday, look for hashtag Monk Drum Monday. Speaking from personal experience, monk drums are wonderfully crafted and they sound amazing. They blend the best traits of both the djembe and the cajon, and I found them to be incredibly versatile in both the live and studio environment. Check them out at monkdrums.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap, and all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today. Complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. Man, hey, Chris. Hi. Hey, I'm in your I'm in your neck of the woods. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. What's up with the rain in California today? Right. It's it's a uh, few and far between, but we appreciate it when it comes. Yeah, I was going to ask how do Californians feel about the rain like this? It's uh yeah, you know, magical in That's a way right. cuz we just never get it. Well, well, it certainly surprised me cuz I came from fairly cold Kentucky. And I was thinking, I'm going to come into Southern California. Yeah, with your shorts on. Yeah, it didn't happen. Um, Hey, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while because 
I, I think you know this, but you're kind of a legend. No. I so I feel anyway. <laughs> in my own mind. That's right. I don't know. Maybe in my mind. But um, Chris, you occupy this this really cool space of songwriter and artist and musician. And you've been able to occupy that space for a while. So I, I was hoping maybe we could just mine some of that, if that'd be cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, before we do that, though, could could we do just like some origin story stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from here. I grew up in Southern California. Yeah. Yeah. Where at in Southern California? Uh, I was born in Orange, just right up the road. And when I was two, we moved to Laguna Beach then South Laguna, Laguna Niguel, my whole life. And now my wife and I and our four or three boys live in San Juan Capistrano. Okay. So when you were growing up, was your family a family of faith? Catholic. Okay. Yeah. Like practicing Catholic? Yeah. Well, every Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, so you went to mass. We went to mass and I was, I went to Catholic school first through eighth grade in Laguna Beach and I was an altar boy. Okay. Yeah. What was, what was faith like for you? You know, it was my parents' faith as it is when you're a kid. And, but I somehow feel like I had some reverence for God. You know, I, I had nothing but a good experience in Catholic school and to be honest, was probably pretty bored in mass, you know, but I can go to mass today and, um, enjoy it and appreciate it and yeah. love taking communion. And yeah. I like that. I was baptized Catholic as a baby in a sense. So when I ever do go to a mass, you can like, take I can go take communion. Yeah. I probably would do it anyway, but that's right. Yeah. Okay. So you're in a family that's kind of like, we go to mass on Sunday. Mm -hmm. When did your faith become personal or, or kind of like become alive for you? I think I was 15, maybe 16. My mom was searching. She was just searching and my, my aunt had gotten saved. She had, was going to this little church in Dana Point and my mom started going to church with her there. And at the time my mom was like going to mass and everything, but she was just kind of searching. She was like reading about reincarnation, all kinds of stuff. And, but this little church, uh, was like 25 people in the Dana Point community center and they prayed for the sick and I, I was born uh, with jaundice and I, I was born with one leg a lot shorter than the other. And I know we've heard a lot of legs growing stories, but yeah, <laughs> I had no grid for healing at all. And this is a church. Um, my aunt was real, it's a small church. So everyone knew each other and, and Heidi Baker would, but she was at that church too. And so my aunt and, and her were friends and my mom said, Hey, I think you should come and they pray for the sick. I want them to pray for your leg. Cause at the time they were thinking about this surgery for me, that was really expensive and really painful and it would take a year of, uh, of a process. And, uh, so I went with her and the pastor after the message, he asked people if they need prayer and the pastor came to me and he just said, your mom told me about you. Can we pray for you? And I said, no, okay. And he sat in a chair right, like that and put my feet up and I, and he just started praying and I just was looking at him and I felt my bones creaking. No it way. was almost like you can hear it. It was yeah. the weirdest feeling. I, I can't forget the feeling. And I just start crying and my mom's crying and, and then, uh, did you, could you I, see it you grow? Could see it, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then he said, do you know Jesus? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, do you want to know Jesus? And I said, yeah, you know, after that. Yeah. How are you going to say no? Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was my born again experience. Yeah. Yeah. So your born again experience is miraculous in some ways. It's deeply connected to the miraculous. It felt so much like love to me because, you know, if you think about it, I had an, I had a, one of my good friends from youth group when we were like, I started going to Calvary Chapel youth group right after that. And we would go out Sunday nights and listen to John Wimber at Canyon High School. And and we were all just come. Like Chuck Chuck Smith Jr. was our pastor. So we would go up with him. And a friend of mine was legally blind. He had Coke bottle glasses. During worship, he was completely healed. Right Just next, during worship, no one prayed no for him? No one even touched him. And I remember John Wimber had a word that 
somebody's uh, right eye was completely healed. His right eye was completely blind. The left eye was legally blind. And John said, somebody's left eye was completely healed. And my friend was so freaked out and then so afraid of being pointed out. And we were going, that's you. Go up there. And he goes, no, it's my right eye. And John goes, oh, I'm sorry. It was your right eye. And yeah. he, and then afterwards, he never, still never raised his hand. He was just embarrassed. There's 3,000, uh, I don't know how many people fit in that gym. It's packed. Thousands. A lot. But yeah. um, so afterwards, we went down to the front to try and find John. And we're these kids, you know, I was probably 17, 16, 17. And, and my friend was more bold than me. And he, we found John and, and we said, you have to hear what happened. My friend was healed during worship, totally healed. He was totally blind. And John said, isn't God great? And he turned around and walked away. <laughs> and that was it. And then we go every Sunday night. And so he never like the next Sunday didn't say, uh, where, you know, last Where's week. Where's the blind guy? Yeah, yeah. Last week, our church was part of this great healing. He never said anything about it. And it was such a sweet thing to me because it reminded me of how in, in the Bible, Jesus would say, don't tell anybody. Yeah. Because it wasn't. All, I'm sorry, I went on this rap chill. But all that to say was that it made me just really believe that the main objective for Jesus is our heart. Yeah. That he, he'll heal someone out of such great compassion and love. But four years later, that friend of mine, he committed suicide. And so as sad as that is, I just feel like the story, in a sense, well, even the blind eye is going to turn to dust. It's a temporary fix. It's, right. not, it's not an eternal thing. But our, our soul is eternal. Yeah. And uh, so I love when... I hear stories about healing when it's someone who doesn't even know who he is. Yeah. I love you know? that. Yeah. I love that. Now, to your point of even blind eyes eventually turn to dust. Poor Lazarus, you know, he gets raised up and he dies again eventually, right? Isn't right. that part of the story? Yeah. Yeah. It's the unspoken part, but you're right. God's God's kindness is for people's heart. Yeah. What mm -hmm. a great story though. Yeah. It's tremendous. Okay, so... When you're there, is this when your heart is coming alive, both to Jesus and to worship? No. Okay. No, I I uh, grew up just a beach kid and playing volleyball and surfing, and and I wasn't playing an instrument or anything. A friend of mine gave me a guitar. I took lessons from a friend's mom, a piano, when I was a little kid. But when I turned 18... Me and three buddies moved to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and just went skiing for a year. And a friend of mine gave me a guitar to take with me. Hey, take this guitar. And so while I was out there, I just fiddled around the guitar. And then, and then when I was out there, a buddy from back home said, "Hey, when you get back, we're joining. We're we're starting a band." <laughs> and I'm like, "All right." He, he goes, "What do you want to play?" And I go, "Well, I got a guitar, and it was acoustic guitar." He goes, okay, well, you're playing guitar. <laughs> and back then it was like in Southern California, there was this kind of like new wave of music from all these young kids were getting saved. And that's when I met Chris Wimber and he had a band called the Lifesavers and, and this punk, all these like punk rock, ska, reggae influence, uh, surf punk kind of just bands like that and we were all just doing this music and we all sucked pretty bad some of us were better than others i was horrible and <laughs> but but because it was so new and churches were seeing such amazing fruit of all these kids wanting this alternative entertainment or whatever it wasn't just entertainment there was like a move of the spirit my wife's first boyfriend was this guy named mike knott and he was the singer of the Lifesavers. And so like that guy alone, he, he has a sad story, but it, at the time he was such an evangelist and he barely knew the Bible, but, and he would just like, they play these songs. He was like the Christian Elvis, you know, all the girls just <laughs> loved him. And like, but like they'd play four gigs in a week and hundreds of kids were just getting saved. And, you know, when Chris was part of that, and the guy would say, Jesus is so rad. 
<laughs> do you want to know that you'll that you'll go to heaven tonight? Some super like yeah, you know, not knowing it much at all what to say, and then all these kids would just get saved. It was like proof of God, proof of the Spirit moving. It wasn't any eloquent words that happened to. There to was not even a this. theological understanding necessarily for what was going on. Right, yeah. no, there was not nothing super deep. Just yeah. God was working through someone. Yeah, and it was it was really the beginning of Christian music. I mean, the Jesus movement was before that, but for all this like young bands that I got to be around, like the Altar Boys and the Lifesavers and Undercover and all these bands in my age group that we all looked up to. So my band called the Spiritones. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of band were you? We were like a ska band kind of. And, <laughs> Did you and, have a horn section? No. Okay. We were like w way not that sophisticated. Okay. And we, we were terrible. And so we would get to play these, like we played Calvary Costa Mesa. 3,000 people would show up because that's what everybody did on Saturday night. What? And they'd watch us and they'd, you know, they were so gracious and still clap after songs. And we were petrified. Chuck Sr. would say, you guys don't bring any attention to yourselves, you know, <laughs> just get up there and play the songs, you know? And so we were just, which was kind of strange, but that that's just what it was. Yeah. He, he was an obviously amazing person, but um, yeah. Uh, it was just the day. It was the day. Yeah, it was, it the was day. just. Yeah, he was trying to be careful, like let not let it get too crazy. Yeah. And uh, how old were you? Eighteen, nineteen. Okay, something like that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. When did when did you start writing songs, Chris? Right around then, I think. Okay. Yeah, pretty bad ones. That's the way it goes. Sure. Yeah. So when you started playing in the spirit tones. And yeah. you started writing some songs. Were you writing for that band or were you writing for all kinds of stuff? Like for church? No, just for that band. And and even then, I wasn't the singer. So the singer was writing the lyrics and doing that. And so I was kind of, I was writing, maybe helping with chord progressions. But if I wrote songs, it would just be for me. And who knows what would happen with them. I don't know. Yeah. When did you write your first song that was for church? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, after that, I got in another band and we got, you know, as people do, you get a little better. And me and four of my childhood friends moved to LA and we just played bars and clubs and we just were trying to get a record deal when that was a thing. And, um, that's when I started writing songs because that's when I, I started singing. Yeah. I started singing because the singer of the spirit tones got sick one night. We had a pizza parlor gig and they're like, you got to sing because you're the, you, we all can't sing at all. And then you can kind of sing. And so that's, and then I got the bug. I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. <laughs> and you never look back. I never look back. You start yeah. another band. Yeah. So, so then I got in another band called labor of love and we, what kind of band was labor of love? We were like, you know, REM and, we were like an alternative band okay. in the worst time in L.A. to be that kind of band. Was this like the glam years? Yeah, Poison, Guns no N' Roses, okay, all those. Okay, so if you're playing in L.A., are you running into those bands? Yes. Okay, tell me a story. Is there a story you can tell? I have a lot of stories. Oh, man, tell me, tell me one about running into the glam. <laughs> well, it was everywhere because back then there was no internet, so... All the the big hair bands would always be on Sunset Boulevard just handing out flyers for their gigs and we'd be handing out our flyers and it was just a joke because they would have an <laughs> army of like girls helping them. <laughs> and we were just like square peg, round hole. But um yeah, I, I went to a I went to this party at the Roxy, this band called Autograph had a record come out and and a friend of mine was friends with them. So I was invited to this. It was like the ultimate metal ba metal show. But it was their <laughs> party for their band. So they got up and played some songs from their new record. And they had all their friends' bands come. So every band played two songs. So Autograph played two songs. And then they were like, okay, ladies and gentlemen, our friends, Rat. And so Rat plays two songs. Mm -hmm. And then they go, hey, okay, ladies and gentlemen, Wasp. And then Wasp plays two songs. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Motley Crue. And they play two songs. And then you were at the epicenter of 80s glam oh, yeah. metal. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I didn't have the hair and, and uh, all that stuff. <laughs> and then the last band was Kiss. 
get and, out. And this was at the Roxy, and it was like, I don't know, 400 people or something. So I actually even kind of liked it. I didn't want to admit it because I was like, whoa, this is kind of epic, you know? Yeah. But anyways. Okay, so is this, I, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. Is this one of the themes of your life? Like uh, there's something alternative about you? Well, in, in the era of in the era of big hair, you're you're playing alternative music. I I, I mean, I don't want to say that I because I I'm not that cool. You know what I mean? Like it's not like yeah. I was different because I was better than anybody. It was just it's just where we came from. I think coming yeah. from South Orange County and and uh, a lot of the big hair bands were like kind of Midwest guys that moved out to L.A. A lot of them were. And so we were just from South Orange County where like in that surf culture, reggae was kind of like when I was in high school, we would listen to Bob Marley and Led Zeppelin mixed together and, you yeah. know, just kind of like, That's we wild. were just from different places yeah. and, you know, what they do is great for them. Them, I didn't really, uh, I would have never wanted to wear the makeup and all that stuff <laughs> anyway. So I'm glad I wasn't into that so, so much, you don't but... have there's no pictures floating around of you in spandex no there's some good pictures sure yeah yeah Man. but not spandex okay no. i had pirate boots and stuff like that uh do you have a pirate shirt oh yeah Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I eventually need to see this photo. Oh, yeah. You know, you won't. Oh, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you're playing the 80s club scene in L.A., when, when did it? When when did you start writing, like, what we would consider to be, like, congregational worship music or songs that people would sing at church for Jesus? Well, when I was living in L.A., Chris Wimber, because we just had known each other from where kids uh, I was at their wedding Chris and Debbie's wedding and and we just knew each other he he was just always a friend so he would come up to LA and he would do sound for us sometimes and just volunteer to be around us and and he kind of like lovingly say you know when you get over yourself come back to church you know and uh, one of my best friends that I'd moved to Colorado with when I was younger he uh, got cancer and passed away and it just freaked me out and it it made me just want to go back home and get out of that scene. And so I started going to Anaheim Vineyard again. At that time, it was in a warehouse kind of by Angel Stadium, Cerritos Street or whatever. And Chris had just started uh, this little label called New Breed. And this band, The Violet Burning, was on it. He, I quit my band and everything, and so he said, we do a record with us. And so I was the second artist on Chris's little label. He did New Breed. and But I was still just doing kind of like blues songs. And But in the midst of that, Eddie Espinosa was one of the worship leaders, and, and he one day said, ah, I just felt like you're supposed to come play with me. So just strum along. So I'd be up there strumming along with Eddie's thing. And it was like, he knew all these weird jazzy chords and he'd play songs that had kind of weird chords that I had no business playing. I, <laughs> and um, so there'd be a lot of times where I'd strum and have the, the pick like an inch away from the strings. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I didn't want to hit bad notes. And <laughs> But it was so sweet because he just knew that I wasn't helping them. I wasn't contributing musically to them, but he just had a heart for me. And and I learned so much from him just watching him lead worship because he, his whole attitude was, you could tell it was like, and I think he even said it, but it was like, I'm going to worship the Lord. If you guys want to come along with me, come on, you know, That's a great but it way was kind of like, yeah. whether, whether you do or not, this is what I'm going to do. And, and so I just watch him and it ended up where, even when they moved to that big building there and now I'd be up there and, and it was like he, it didn't matter at that time, that place was always full and it just, he didn't lead worship like that. It wasn't, it wasn't like, um, he would sing these simple songs like change my heart and, and songs that he wrote and other people's songs. But it was like so many times I'd look over and see him with his eyes closed and tears coming down his face. And I, I was just really, I'm so grateful to this day that I just got to got to be invited into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of that vineyard thing caught not taught. Yeah. Yeah, you you were just around it and it got on you. But it, and it was such a blessing that I was invited. 
you know, like yeah. I, I, uh, I shouldn't have been his first choice or fifth choice or tenth choice. You know, it was just nice that um, I was brought along like that. Hey friends, Mike O'Brien, director of the Vineyard School of Worship. Hey, our sound lab is happening at the end of January, 2020. You're not gonna wanna miss this. We've trained over 200 techs in the vineyard and the church at large. This is an incredible investment, both relationally, spiritually, and technically. Your church will benefit, but also the person you send will benefit from this. VSOW.org. Use the code FERMENT15 for 15% off. VSOW.org. Check it out. Sound Lab happening in Atlanta. I knew that we were going to do this podcast and Heather and I were talking about it the other day. Heather's my wife. And she and I remembered the first time that we encountered you. You, you wouldn't have known. It was, it was many years ago. It would have been in the nineties. We were in high school in Kentucky and we went to this youth camp called summer in the sun. You went to that? Yeah. Wow. And you led worship there. Hmm. I, and at this point, Heather and I really didn't know what the vineyard was. Hmm. Right. We, we didn't really know there wasn't even a, we weren't a part of the vineyard or whatever. And, uh, you led worship and I remember you, you had your band and you led worship and I remember you guys did some songs that I'd never really heard, but the power of God came in the room. Like mm. I wouldn't have had language for it at that time. Cause we were a part of kind of like a church of Christ tradition that really wouldn't have had language for that sort of experience with the spirit. Yeah. But I remember telling Heather uh, when we were there, I don't know what it is about this guy and I don't know what he's doing, but it's like touching our hearts, you know, mm -hmm. but it was just, it was whatever you had been brought up in, whatever you had maybe been learning from Eddie, whatever you'd been given permission to be, whatever Chris had done in making a platform for you. You like, you brought it all the way over to Kentucky and you're just doing your thing. Right. And yeah. it was, it was blowing our hearts up. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it a weird, isn't that's that weird? Amazing. No, it's such a weird story. That is weird. Yeah. Well, I remember we got fired. I mean, not fired, but we did the first year. They invited us to come do it. Cause this guy, Louis, Louis Weber, did you know? Big yeah. Louis? Well, Louis invited us. And uh, he had gotten this record I did with Kevin Prosh called Soul Motion. And he liked the music, but it wasn't a worship record. So Louie was like the one who really got me into thinking about being a worship leader. Because he calls my wife, or tries to call me. My wife answers the phone and says, I got this record from your husband. And I want him to come lead worship for this youth thing in Kentucky. And she's like, he doesn't lead worship. Because at the time I didn't, I just played guitar with Eddie. No way. Yeah. And then he, he said, well, I think he's supposed to. And uh, she goes, well, I don't know if he'd be able to do it. I mean, it was like in, you know, in a month, two months away or something. And, and he goes, well, I got 1500 bucks for him. She goes, okay, he's a worship leader. <laughs> <laughs> and we're on our way. And then she's like, you learned to lead worship. I don't know if it was fifth, whatever it was, but, and so we did the first year and the whole, the board of Summer in the Sun told Louie, we don't want him back because it was too weird. And you guys, uh, it was amazing. Well, I don't know if you were there the first year. Maybe it wasn't so amazing. I don't know. But the, but it was just, it was just not what they usually would have. So the next year they had the singer of Petra do tracks and all the kids complained so much about that, that they invited us back. And then we did like four more years or something. Yeah. And I don't know which year that I was there when you guys were there, but I distinctly remember you guys playing, I think it's that David Roos song, We Will Dance. Oh yeah. Bro. Like that's not even a song that I would, would have ever connected with as a, 
as a high school boy, right? Yeah. Yeah, what high school boy's going to dance on the street? Well, maybe on the streets that are going, but not yeah. not now. That's right, right? <laughs> yeah. But it it I just remember it touched my heart. Oh. And I was like, okay, this is something new and I've never seen this before. Mm. Yeah. Was Raymond with me? I think Raymond was with you. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's that's, one a couple of years where he didn't go, but that's that's too good. There's another guy I brought with me one time his name's Dickie Ochoa, but he changed his name later to Richard Swift. Have you heard of Richard Swift? No. He just passed away, sadly, alcohol. But he was, he's a great singer songwriter as he's, as he got older, but he, he was a Christian young kid that, um, anyways, he, he ended up, uh, killing himself, drinking to death, but he, he was in the, the shins he was the keyboard player and then he was in the black keys he played bass for the black keys and he he produced all these records like nathaniel ratcliffe records and mm. did really a lot of cool music um and he just fell away from the lord got really into mm. drugs and alcohol but um anyways he was he i don't know if he was there when oh. he did one of those two and he played keys yeah yeah well okay so even that story right there, it's really interesting. And it's something that I've sort of picked up in a couple of stories you've told and, and maybe something that I've noticed in your life from afar is that you have this uh, really cool ability to walk in two worlds, kind of like the church worship world and then also the maybe general market rock and roll world. And it seems like you have lots of friends and all these different places. Can you talk about that for a little bit? What is, what is that? I don't know what that is. I mean, I like, um, God has been put, has put people in my life. I think my love and my desire would be is that they'd be so filled up with the love of Jesus that that would just become every bit of their life as I want that to be every bit of mine. Like, like I have a lot of friends that grew up in the church that go out and play in the world but they, they, they leave their faith in a sense. They don't talk about it. Or they don't even sing about it anymore. And, you know, I just love when people can go out in the world and boldly sing about Christ. To me, that's brave. That's, that's being like, if you want to be cool and be rebellious, everyone else is singing about everything else. But sing about Jesus. Talk about, like, edgy, you know. Yeah. Like when I see Mavis Staples in front of the president or in front of anybody in the world. And she's always singing about Jesus. And she's so filled up with the joy of the Lord that nobody can deny it. Yeah, People's lives get sh sh shaken when they're around her because it's so authentic and real. Yeah, And it makes me sad when I have friends that have known that joy so much, but for some reason they're nervous or afraid to sing about it. Yeah. I'm like, just, you know. It's the true rock and roll. That's what I, I hear you so. saying. Yeah. I maybe, think so. maybe, maybe I mean, that's the anyone, spot we're in right now. Who's the coolest that's ever lived? Jesus. Yeah. Who's the one that's, you know, done the most damage in a good way? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. who's, the, who's the real rebel? That's right. It's Jesus. You know, he's the one. He's the one that, like, he's the one whose name is so powerful that it's offensive. You know what I mean? Way more offensive than the Sex Pistols ever thought they were, or whatever. You know. Yeah, Chris, you're preaching. I'm sorry, bro. This is good. Come on with it. Well, I it just, you know, you and me both. We we have a lot of friends that have slowly, and and I felt it in myself. I, I know when I feel my heart grow hard. Yeah. And I know when the world is telling me I'm supposed to do be a certain way or this way uh, to be more accepted or whatever. And, um, I don't want to go with the culture. I want to be counterculture. You know, I don't, I, I know that, um, the Bible says that I'll be persecuted for my faith. And so if I don't experience that persecution, where am I in my faith? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Jesus says it right up front in Matthew five, right? Hmm. I don't know. That's, yeah, I'd does. like to go, yeah, Matthew 5 and yeah, quote, no, and quote yeah, it, but yeah. I can't. It's, it's like right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, right? Yeah, preach it. 
That's it. Yeah. Okay, um, good. I yeah, know that's right. We're on the out. same page. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, I guess I have an, a, another question, you know, in this in this sort of like space, because you played in all of these rock bands, you have led a lot of worship, uh, and you've written songs that have touched the church. And one of the things I so appreciate about you is that you have your own voice. And and I mean that like in your singing voice, but I also mean it like in the, the trueness of your spirit. I feel like when you play music, I'm not getting a cover band or a cover artist. I feel like I'm getting like, this is Chris Lazat. Nobody else could bring this, but Chris Lazat, right? Um, so I'm wondering, how did you find your true voice? Or how did you, how did you find that thing that you do? I don't know. I think you just stumble upon it. I, don't, I mean, I, that sounds kind of easy answer, but I, I don't think it's something I've like consciously sought out to find or something. It's just more of, I'm a product of my environment and I'm just trying to keep my environment um, healthy for me. Yeah. You know, like I'm trying to walk a daily walk, you know, I'm trying to like draw near to him. So he'll draw near to me. All these things that I've been taught, I really want to activate. I really want to do it. And, and I find myself hating the things that I do and all the things that we all struggle with. But I, I also, uh, keep just putting one foot in front of the other and just yeah. heading towards the light, you know, as much as I can. Yeah. And so I, I'm hoping that as I read my Bible or pray and fellowship with my friends and be around people that are a good influence into me and I've had so many people in my life that have just been so selfless with me as a person, just as a friend, just like loved me with no conditions. And, and so I, I want to do that too, you know, anyway, so yeah. maybe that's all part of finding my voice. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely part of it. I, I know that being accepted, like really, really accepted does tend to create the kind of safe space that people need to be there or even come to terms with their, their truest self and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as a human being, but then also as an artist and even as a singer, like you actually sometimes need people to like really care for you in order for that thing to emerge. Yeah. So I think that's actually deeply connected. Mm. Hey, you, you just said a moment ago, you said you've had so many people like friends be so selfless and care for you. Like who, who are some of those people and, and how, how have they cared for you through your life? If you don't mind sharing, because I, I, sometimes I think these stories are so important for other people to hear. Well, there's some, a few big ones, like Eddie was definitely one. Yeah. Um, Kevin Prosh was one. Yeah. When, when we did that Soul Motion record, he said, I feel like the Lord wants me to lay down my guitar for a year and play keyboards for you and teach you about worship. And I'm like, at that point, he had already written So Come and Banner Over Me and and some of these, and he was leading worship at the Anaheim Vineyard. He still continued to do that, but he just, for a year, he didn't go travel and do itinerant kind of stuff. He was on staff at Anaheim, but he would go play with me. And at, at that time, I had done just my second record, which me and Raymond and Kevin and uh, this guy, Icky, and, and Paul Martin did. And... And we were playing like juvenile detention hall or one night and then playing some little church in, in Bakersfield another night, just not glory, glory gigs or whatever. But, <laughs> but for us at the time, we were just having fun being friends together and playing together. And, and Kevin was going and doing these things with us. And it was interesting. And I know you have a history with Kevin too. And, and at the time, this was before a lot of mess in his life and stuff. Yeah. And he would, he freaked me out a lot because he would see in the spirit so much and see, he'd see good, but he'd also see really dark demonic stuff. And so he would just point up at, like we were in this one juvenile detention hall and, and it, and I would just get the creeps because he would say, oh, I, I look at his face and something was wrong. And I go, what's the matter? And he goes, there's demons all over this place. <laughs> <laughs> there's lust, there's yeah. like uh, some other ones and he'd just yeah. name them all. And I'd go, Oh gosh, yeah, take me out of here. And we're locked in there. 
But, um, but, uh, so he gave a year just to, yeah, I mean, what, probably more than a year. He took, a, took me to Europe for the first time with, with our band. We went to Switzerland and, and my band did all the street ministry. And then his band went to Larry Myers and Tony and Sue, who you might know, a mm-hmm. bass player. And anyway, so this was his band back then. They would do this conference and burn and then we would do like the street stuff and we go to different towns and do street stuff and so kevin would come play hammond with me and then at night go there and i remember one night this conference there's three thousand people in this called the fest hall it was where bon jovi played like it was a big place and back then they'd have pretty big conferences in switzerland and europe with vineyard stuff and maybe they still do i don't know but um i remember this heroin addict that we saw on the street with a needle sticking out of his arm and blood coming down his arm and laying in a, like against a wall. I remembered him and we prayed. I didn't, someone else prayed for him and I was watching it. And later that night, there was posters all over the town telling everyone to go to this conference, this fest hall. Like they wanted lost people to go. It was a Christian conference, but they wanted people from the, that's why we did the street ministry stuff. And I, I remember standing in the back of the fest hall during worship and there's Kevin up there singing, so come. And that guy walked in the back door and he was hammered. I mean, stumbling in, Yes. He falls flat on his face and then gets up and goes, what's happening to me? What's happening? To me? He's like, yeah. started like screaming and all these guys went around him and they, they were like, they started saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he goes, what is this? What is this? And um, one one guy was with me, spoke Swiss German, and I said, tell me what he's saying. And the one guy was telling him, it's Jesus. And he goes, I want Jesus. And it was like just everyone else, like during the song, it was such a holy moment. Everyone was like on their knees and it and was just, this is going and on. this guy walks in and falls right on his face from the presence of the Lord. I, and I had never seen anything like that. And then it breaks my heart because I, you know, spent so much time with him for, for some years after that with Kevin. And to this day, I, he's my favorite songwriter, singer songwriter ever. Yeah. But also probably the most anointed guy I've ever been around. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, probably late 90, I don't know when it was late nineties. I, I I accidentally went to this Kevin Prosh meeting. I had I had no idea who he was. I had no clue what was going to happen. It was in Nashville. I'm I'm just a young guy. I I I thought, well, this is a worship night. I'll go. I didn't know who Kevin was, and he went in. And Kevin started by playing a song that seemed like most other people in the room knew. Like just kind of started that song, and he had a band, like a little five piece band or something. And then about like five or six minutes into this song that people seem to know, he just, the music never stopped, but the song began to change. And all of a sudden we were playing a song that no one knew and singing words that I, it took me, a, I was, cause I was kind of slow. Cause I just wasn't quick on the uptake here, but I eventually came to realize, oh, he's making this up. Like this is spontaneous. And all of a sudden the whole room is singing these spontaneous choruses with Kevin. Mm. And this went on for over an hour. Like the song never, never stopped, but it kept changing. And of course, you know what I'm talking about. Kept changing and kept changing and kept changing. And the words kept coming and the room went with it. And all I could feel was it it just, the room, uh, I can't even hardly describe it other than it felt heavy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like it felt heavy. And by the, by the end, after an hour or so, Chris, I'm laying in the floor Mm. because it's just so heavy now. And it feels like, it feels like whatever heaven is. Right. It feels like it's just, it's in this room with us. Right. Uh, Yeah. And I got up from that moment. I thought, I have no idea what I've just been a part of, Mm -hmm. but I'm ruined. Like I, this is it. Like whatever we just did, yeah, yeah. This is the point, you know. And it 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 changed me as a worshiper, worship leader, songwriter forever. Yeah, yeah. I, I became like, um, I don't know. I just became so hungry for 
someone who could take risks in worship and uh, it felt like worship was a conversation, you know, you know, it's like, right. It felt like, it felt like we were singing something and then God was singing something yeah. and then we would sing something and then God would sing something. It was, it was beautiful. He, and like what I was talking about before about our friends that go out into the world, like you remember the peppercorns and he yeah. was doing that thing. And I remember we went to England and, and uh, Scotland and I opened for them there. So it was all theaters and like secular places or whatever, but that kind of thing was what he was doing. In the midst of it, he was in a tough spot personally, but his heart started at, I want to take this into the world. And there was no apologies. He was yeah. like, this is what I do. This is who I worship and this is what we do. But, you know, people were coming a word of mouth or whatever was happening. People were coming, filling these places. And, uh, and that's, that's like, when I think about what you're asking about, like straddling this yeah. s sacred and secular, whatever, yes. I just want people to like, let's, let's be sacred people in the world, yeah. not of the world, but be in the world that we are, you know? Yeah. And, and we don't need to change from, Oh, I lead worship and I get paid to lead worship at this church on Sundays, but my, this is what I really do. This is my real love. Well, just do, do both, you know, but do, don't change, you know, that anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I love uh, it. It's a great word. People need to hear it. You yeah. know, what's interesting, Chris, I recorded another podcast this morning mm -hmm. with a friend and she was saying the exact same things. Mm. She was, she, it, it's interesting to me now, maybe this is what this day is about in some ways, mm. uh, She's just one of these people who lives with one foot in one world. She's like in high end fashion and she's a pastor. Oh. Yeah. And she, you know, she was li literally just telling me three hours ago, why can't we just be the same person in both places? Well, wouldn't that be great if God is just pulling us into that? I think he is. Because I understand when people don't want to do that because it's not easy. It's uncomfortable and and it's, it's uh, fearful. But wouldn't that be interesting is maybe her saying that and maybe us talking about it is maybe, maybe that's God saying this is where it's going. I think so. Which would be so cool. Yeah, and it's giving people permission. Yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Hey, can I talk to you about songs for a second? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't, this is kind of a weird question, but kind of gets to the heart at it for me. Where do songs come from? Where do your songs come from? It's just from my life, you know, like yours come from your life. You know, it's just like, uh, that's all we can authentically write from is from our life and our own story. And, um, I've tried to write like, uh, congregational worship songs that I think would be good for the church or something, but I don't, I'm not there, you know, and it's hard for me. Not that I don't think you could do it and pull it off. We were talking about, uh, who were we talking about this morning? Was it this morning? Oh yeah. I was at a meet church meeting with my pastor and a, a friend of mine who's a producer. And he, we were just talking, he, someone asked me about Matt Redman and I don't know him very well, I've known him a little bit and I just said, I just think he's an amazing person. He's like, 
he writes these songs that connect with the church so well, but so many of them are about suffering and they connect because we all suffer, you know? And so he comes off, his songs come off as so genuine, even though they're the big, can be the big pop hits of the church. That's right. Which is good for him, you know, good for the church. That, yeah, both. But um, anyways, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, he's... People aren't writing songs like that from just no place. Right. It's coming from a place. Yeah. 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 So I hear you say that you write songs from your life. Does that mean that you're writing all the time or does that mean you're, it's like seasonal and yeah. there's like moments? Yeah. Yeah. How does that work? Well, I think I'm, I'm probably, uh, I want to be inspired. So I wait for inspiration and Sometimes inspiration comes when you actually take a step and it's been a while since I've taken a step, you know? Yeah. But when I do, I tend to look inside and kind of wanting to write from an authentic place if, if I can. And, but I haven't written much in a while. So I, I don't know why. Yeah. yeah. It is funny how that works, but I have come to realize over the last few years even the forest has winter, right? Mm. And it's important. Yeah. So, like, winter's not bad. Yeah, I don't beat myself up about it. Yeah. I don't. I, I feel like um, I have so many other things that I can do to become better that I feel like are probably maybe more important than writing a song anyway. I don't know. Yeah. There's enough great songs out there and enough people still writing great songs that... um. I don't feel like anyone needs my songs. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe they do. You well, know, maybe, I'm, I'm maybe, grateful may, if, if... Maybe the world does, though. Well, I'm grateful if, if God uses them and, and, and they bless people. But um, if I never wrote another song, God speaks anyway. Amen. So. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. So where do you get inspiration? Sadly, from sorrow, mostly. It yeah. seems like, yeah. I mean, it seems like uh, the last 10 years, it's just been like, I went through a really tough time of panic and anxiety, like a lot of people do, that I'm finding I'm finding that out. The more I've talked about it, the more I realize I'm, uh, the good thing about it is I found I'm not alone, you know, and I've had to go on medication and had really bad panic attacks. And so songs can be like, like Psalms, you know, in, in that way. And I don't like it. I like it. I like those songs because it does help people to connect and they can relate. But I wish I could write more songs of joy and more so praise. You know, I love like, I went to a Kirk Franklin concert and it was like <laughs> one of the best things I've ever been to. You know, yeah, it was just high so praise. high praise. And I just part of me is I feel like such a dork because I'm tall white guy <laughs> and so so like part of me is there wanting to wanting to like jump up and down with people but yeah. I'm like if I jump up and down everyone's going to turn and look at this tall goofy guy <laughs> jumping up and down but I feel it in my spirit you know yeah. I I just I, I wish I could do that you know yeah. I love that stuff yeah so I listen to it yeah enjoy yeah. it yeah okay uh slightly different question w what's a perfect day a perfect day. I, you know, having a good day. I just had lunch with my oldest son. Yeah. And What's his name? Dana. And he lives in Costa Mesa. And it was really nice because I kind of blew it. We, the other night we went and got a Christmas tree with my two other boys and their girlfriends. And they just were like, let's go get a tree. And I, I didn't think about calling my son who lives, doesn't live with us. And, uh, he like texted one of the boy or one of the boy's girlfriends and s said, thanks for the invite <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and he told me that today at lunch and I just felt yeah. so terrible. But I said, I said, you know what, Dana, they, they got to go to Home Depot and get a tree and, um, but they're not at Sabatino's eating spicy sausage and salad. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the winner now? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he goes, you're right. You're right. So, uh -huh. that, so it was, I, you know, I think you would probably say the same thing. Yeah. Our best times are, are with our kids and our wife 
and uh, our families, you know. Yeah. Yeah, my son is here with me this week. I know. He's awesome. Yeah, he's a sweet boy. He is a sweet boy. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting you say that. You mentioned your son. I've been very, very tender about my sons and my, and my children, like, this year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How many kids do you have? I have four. And my oldest, who's with me, uh, River, he's he's 18, and I have felt, I don't know, I have just felt very tender about him. When my friend Jared Boyd, he called me in the summer, and he, he said, Adam, how are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm okay. He's like, and Jared says, well, how's your family? How are your children? Tell me about your, and Jared's a really good man. And I said, well, they're, they're really good. And I told him about my kids, went through the list, and and I said, yeah, River 17 and da, da, da. And he says, oh, he's 17. He's, when does he turn 18? And I said, in December, turns 18 next week. And um, he says, oh my goodness, Adam. He goes, he could be out of your house this year. And when he said that, like it landed on me, you know, landed on me, like not in a, in a heavy negative way, but in a heavy, serious way. And, and so all the issues of parenting and fatherhood of like surfaced, but in a really way, it's made me, I've always been tender and a bit gushy over my kids, but it's made me real tender towards him. You know, he's a musician and I'm, I don't know. I just want him around this stuff. Yeah. You know, I told him yesterday that you should have told your dad, let to let, say, let me drum on this. <laughs> Quit getting these hot shots. And yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Nepotism is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I will say this. <clears throat> Monday, because we were tracking for this this song with Andy, mm -hmm. uh, Squires, we're tracking one of his songs. Monday we went, I wasn't here, I was flying here. I'd flown River out early. And Monday uh, they were tracking with Aaron Sterling, who's one of River's drumming heroes. Oh, so they got, nice. he got to be in the studio with them and he was like eating that up. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, Yeah. When it comes to perfect day, I'm with you. Like, if I can be with my kids, if there's food around, if there's a bottle of wine, if my wife could be there, yeah, game over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My youngest son is moving out next week, or no, 10 days, and it's tough. Yeah. He's our youngest, you know. We have oh. three, three boys, and he's moving to Arizona to go to um, Harley Motorcycle School. Motor cycle fix at school yeah like a trade school yeah. which we're really happy for him and he loves it he builds bikes and stuff but um it's weird when your youngest moves out yeah that's that's got to be a different emotion huh yeah yeah man it won't be long though and there'll be all these new people coming to your house little guys probably well, that's, yeah we're trying to like say well, you know wait a minute but you know put the ring on the finger but yeah, that's right but then let's get going that's right Next season of life. Yeah. All right. Hey, Chris, a couple quick hitters. Okay. Gibson or Martin? I have two Gibsons, yeah. Okay. Answer that easy. Surfing or motorcycles? I have both. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, mean, I was trying to pin you down there. Sorry. In and out or five guys? In and out. No brainer. Southern California, Northern California. Southern. I have only known Southern, but I like Central. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The Central Coast. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. Hey, Chris, Um, last question. Uh, and this is a new question for season two, because we, we try to have a little harmony or a little melody going through all of these episodes. Could you tell me what you're dreaming about these days? Or what's the dream of your heart right now? I want to finish well. And... um I do dream about heaven and I kind of freaks me out a little bit because I don't want it to be like, Oh, remember that podcast Chris did and he just talked about heaven. Then he died in the car wreck. I'm sorry. I'm laughing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's how morbid I am. I'm laughing with you. Okay. But, um, but yeah, so I do, I do think about that. I mean, there's just so much sadness and so much like division in the world and it makes me long for peace, you know? And, um, I just, there's so many, you know, as a pastor of a church, there's just tragic stories in so many people's lives. And thankfully my story has been not so tragic, but I still deal with some depression and stuff. And so it makes me long for like, I'm good with when all that's 
you know, when this is all behind us. Yeah. When everything's made new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. I can feel that. I can feel that, especially these days. I get that. Mm. Yeah. Man, Chris, thank you for coming on this podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Dude, thanks for sharing your story. And thanks for being vulnerable. That's really, really great. And I uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, could you do maybe one more thing? Sure. If it'd be cool. Uh, if it's if it's cool with you, would would you just pray a prayer uh, for all of our artists and musicians mm. who are listening to this podcast? Even if it was just a little, a little simple prayer blessing or whatever's in your head and heart. Would okay. that be cool? Yeah. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us all. Lord, we surrender our lives to you again. Would you remind us of the day of our salvation? And you, would you become our first love again, our passion, our very breath, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Amen. 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 Thanks, Chris. Fist bump. Boom. Corum here, producer of the Ferment Podcast. Thank you for listening to episode one of season two. We've got a lot of great things in store for you this year. We can't wait to share them with you. Here's a couple things you can do to help us. Rate and review us on iTunes. This helps more people find us. Also remember to subscribe to our Sing Together playlist on Spotify. This is where you'll find all of our monthly singles. All right. Thanks for helping us get the word out. Peace. Peace.